definite. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoy. So as you might or might not know, neonatal medicine kind of focuses on treating infants uh, from premature life all the way up to 28 days. Um, and these can these infants can have really complex health needs sometimes. Um, and while neonatal medicine is something that we do learn a little bit about at medical school, um, it remains a growing specialty and we're aware that not many people have experience within the specialty and hence why we wanted to talk to you today about the journey of a preterm infant and what a consultant neonatologist would do in the in, in that journey. So the aims of the lecture today are to go over why babies are born preterm and what can be done to help them before and at delivery, what challenges they may face in the neonatal unit and beyond, uh, what happens next, and then at the end we're going to just discuss some uh, big ongoing research that's happening within the world of neonatal medicine. So we're going to start with a bit of a timeline um, from kind of premature birth all the way to healthy infancy. So the World Health Organization gives three definitions for a preterm infant. The first one is extremely preterm. So that's any infant that's born before 28 weeks. The second definition is very preterm, which is 28 to 31 weeks. And then there's moderate to late preterm, which is 32 weeks all the way to 37 weeks, which is kind of the normal period in which we'd want a mum to give birth. Um, so the majority of infants will be born at 37 weeks and they'll go along this timeline and reach healthy infancy and beyond completely normal um, no health problems um, and they'll live happily like that for the rest of the life however some infants and especially those in preterm um, do have medical complications and it's this period with the question marks that we're going to kind of cover today so what neonatal medicine focuses on is getting them from this preterm kind of situation to healthy infancy so they can carry on life as everyone else. So for the purpose of the lecture, we're gonna be talking about Ruby, who is the little baby in the image. Um, now we've changed things, so um, it's all confidential, um, but Ruby is kind of our patient for the day and that's who we're kind of following. Um, so, to begin with a bit of background, so Ruby was born at 28 weeks. Now the average weight of a newborn baby is around 3,500 um, grams, and that can range normally from 2,500 all the way to 4,500. In kind of layman's terms, that's around 5.5 pounds to 10 pounds. So what you'd normally see, you know, in family members or what you may have weighed when you was born. Um, however, our preterm infant Ruby in this instant was born at 800 grams, which is the equivalent to 1.8 pounds. So very much under the average. And premature birth is um, a common cause for um, low birth weight. And while low birth weight infants can be healthy and have no problems um, and go on to lead a very healthy infancy, um, sub there's quite a few that are at risk of complications and they need to spend time in the neonatal intensive care unit. So survival rates are increasing as medical advances take hold, um, but there is still uh, a lot of infants that unfortunately don't make it when they're born preterm. And in general, the survival rate for a preterm infant does depend on the gestational age in which they are born. So for example, if an infant is born at less than 22 weeks, then there's a near to zero chance of survival. That increases at 22 weeks to 10%, and then at 24 weeks to 60%, um, 27 weeks would be around 89%, 31 weeks at 95%, and from 34 weeks onwards would be the same as a full-term infant. Um, so it really does depend how preterm an infant is as to regards to um, the survival of that infant. With regards to handicap rates, as you can imagine, the earlier an infant is born, the higher the chance of problems. So one in 10 preterm infants um, will have a permanent disability. So this can include lung diseases, cerebral palsy, um, deafness, 
and blindness and one in two preterm infants who are born before 26 weeks so a little before Ruby was um, will have a long life a lifelong disability unfortunately. Now for a number of women um, preterm delivery can be anticipated and predicted during antenatal visits um, this is because of known risk factors, which you may have heard of, such as preeclampsia, diabetes or gestational diabetes, um, if the woman is carrying twins, and also if there is bleeding after the first trimester. And during these antenatal visits, um, if a lady is at risk of premature birth, then they can have a fetal fibronectin test. So basically, fetal fibronectin is a protein which is produced by cells in the baby, and it acts a bit like a glue. So it keeps the amniotic sac attached to the womb, um, which is what we want for as long as possible. If a woman is then likely to have a preterm birth, the protein will be released and it will travel through the vagina and they'll be able to swab that and that's then detected. Um, as with anything, it's not 100% accurate. Um, but it is something that can help kind of estimate whether a, a lady is likely to um, deliver preterm or not. Now, those um, preterm babies and their mothers uh, need really to be um, kept in close monitor by a hospital that contains a neonatal intensive care unit um, because Babies that are born outside of a neonatal intensive care unit that are premature do have poorer long-term outcomes. That being said, obviously with the fetal fibronectin test not being 100% and women that are predicted to deliver preterm not always actually delivering preterm, it makes the judgment call for consultants such as Dr Philpot really difficult to decide which women they need to bring in and which women they leave at home. Um, as to whether the baby will be born preterm or not. Um, as you can imagine, the best transport method for these babies is mum. So if we can keep baby in mum for as long as possible, and at least till we get to a NICU, then that is the best thing we can do. Now, when these babies are born, quite often um, they may need some, um, some help, some assistance, and to stay in hospital for a little while in a NICU. It was previously thought um, that babies born like Ruby at 28 weeks would require resuscitation techniques. However, it's recently been found um, that gently supporting these babies into ex-uterine life is actually much more beneficial. And this is now included in newborn life support course training. So what that means is instead of invasively managing these babies, we gently help them. So in the first 10 minutes of life, um, in the case of Ruby, these babies can have an oxygen saturation of 75%, which as we know, is not great. Um, however, that increases in that 10 minutes all the way to 92% with no medical intervention at all. Um, just showing that stabilizing and gently helping these infants is much better in some situations than resuscitation. Um, other stabilisation methods that take place in the NICU will be good thermal care um, and providing a thermal balance to these infants and also delaying the clawed clamping um, can also reduce the need for blood transfusions. Um, so there really is a lot that we can do and a lot that we can help with, um, but quite big challenges to this population of infants, as you, you can see. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over now to Dr. Philpot, who's going to take you through kind of the rest of Ruby's preterm um, journey. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about what goes on and how neonatal medicine um, is involved with the next part. Thank you, Holly. I'm, I'm gonna need you though to be in charge of slides if that's okay. Yeah. Perfect. So as Holly has already said, and this is Ruby and her mum, Claire, um, we knew Ruby was good, so I was a consultant neonatologist around when Ruby was born. Um, we knew she was going to be born because unfortunately her sister Lauren, the year before, had also been born preterm, even more preterm than, than Ruby. And unfortunately, Lauren hadn't survived. Um, so her mum had been watched. 
she she was being monitored she was in a hospital um, and if in the right level of hospital one that could provide neonatal intensive care because as holly has said we know that these babies if we can actually deliver them in a hospital that provides the care they need their outcomes are much much better um, the way that neonatal care is organised in the UK, we have three levels of neonatal care. We have special care baby units for the less preterm infants, for those babies who probably just need a little bit of feeding and growing. Our local neonatal units for babies born um, above 27 weeks gestation who might need some short term ventilation support and then a little bit of invasive feeding. And then our neonatal intensive care babies, our neonatal intensive care units, they look after babies born after 22 weeks gestation. So from 22 weeks plus zero days, we will offer full intensive care to these babies. So for me, Ruby at 800 grams was actually a massive baby um, because a baby born at 22 weeks can often be as small as around about 400 grams, so half the size of Ruby. So when a baby um, who, is, who is extremely preterm is delivered in the neonatal intensive care, the important things are having the right team at the delivery. So for a preterm baby of Ruby's gestation, there is generally a consultant, um, a team of doctors, so probably two doctors or advanced practitioners, and one or two of our neonatal nurses. And as, Ruby, as Holly has beautifully described, when they are born, um, we try very hard not to do anything that we don't have to do to them. What we don't want to do is we don't want to massively inflate their lungs when they are born, because we know that even doing this once, twice, three times, that can actually cause long-term lung damage. So we try very, very hard to support the baby's breathing wherever we can, to give as little oxygen as we possibly can, um, and really to give that good thermal care, <coughs> excuse me, in the delivery room. In the past, we used to put these babies, we used to support these babies in 100% oxygen, but we know actually that's a dangerous thing to do because oxygen is the most important oxidant that we know. And again, that can leave a baby at risk of long-term neurodevelopmental um, delay. Um, it can set up development of abnormal nerve pathways, and certainly it can lead to long-term sight and even blindness. Um, so when Ruby was born, she was, uh, at the time, um, we supported her. We didn't have to intubate her. We gave her just some support to support her breathing. We delivered, she was delivered into a plastic bag um, because any baby that is under 31 weeks gestation, we know the plastic bag is fantastic. They are delivered feet first into the plastic bag. We then put the plastic bag around their neck, just loosely. And they're then sort of kept in a little, sort of, it's a bit like in a little greenhouse. So thermal loss is kept to a minimal. Um, they don't lose water. Um, we don't cause any um, damage to the skin. So Ruby then was transported to the neonatal unit um, in our transport incubator with some respiratory support in a plastic bag and was put into one of our pre-warmed um, incubators. So we have what we call the golden hour, which is the first hour where we like to do everything that we need to do. And then babies like Ruby can then be left and ideally left in peace and quiet, aiming to mimic the conditions as if they were still in utero. So in that first hour, we do whatever we need to do to support the breathing. Um, if Ruby was born today, what we would do now is something called Lisa, which is we would intubate, have a little lockdown um, to see her vocal cords, and we'd pass a tiny little catheter through and give some medicine called surfactant, which is an artificial um, glycoprotein, which mimics the, the naturally occurring surfactant that is maximally produced at 32 weeks gestation. And I like to describe surfactant as being like an engine oil, because what it does, it actually makes the work of breathing much, much easier for these preterm infants and leaves us less likely to cause any severe damage to the lungs. 
So we would have done this with Ruby if she was born now. We didn't at the time, but this is what we would do now. Um, we also at that point put in any lines or any drips we need to. We know that the skin is the best form of protection for these babies. So we try and protect them by, by reducing any break in the skin if we can. So ideally, what we like to do is put invasive lines into the lines in the belly button, into the umbilical vessels. So those arteries and veins or vein that were connecting the babies in utero to the placenta. So we artificially um, put those lines, we put those lines in under sterile conditions. So we can then sample blood from the baby without causing any damage to the skin. We can keep an eye on blood pressure. And also we can give artificial nutrition, um, something called parental nutrition that some of you may have come across in the adult setting. And um, we can give drugs, we can give sedation, we can give anything. And the idea being by doing this, we can do as much as we need to the baby without handling and without causing any pain or distress. All of our preterm babies will get antibiotics, but unlike in the past when Ruby was a baby, um, we now give antibiotics for as short a period of time as possible. And we do this because what we don't want to do is cause drug resistance. Um, because you never know, and this is unfortunate, it's what happened with, with Ruby's sister, Lauren. Lauren had a, a drug resistant infection and we, did, we couldn't save her. Um, and that's because some of our commonest, commonest pathogens that we find on the neonatal unit and become resistant to, to some antibiotics. So when I was a medical student, flucloxacillin was used to treat lots and lots of skin infections. Um, the, 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 the infections now, the bugs now, that cause our skin infections and they can get into the bloodstream and kill babies are now resistant to flucloxacillin. And that's because we used antibiotics too much and unwisely in the past. But we now, 36 hours, if a baby is not showing any signs of infection, we would stop the antibiotics to give them the best chance of being able to be used against the next time a baby is born preterm that we, and we can use these antibiotics. So we like to keep um, our babies on narrow stream antibiotics for as short a period as possible. Um, and then ideally, within, a, within an hour, the baby will have had, an anti uh, had a chest X-ray or an abdominal X-ray, will have had a cranial ultrasound scan to see if there is any abnormal bleeding in the brain that might predict later um, handicap. And then hopefully in that first hour, then we can hands off, the golden hour has been completed and our nursing team can then take over and give that lovely pastoral support to our preterm babies. In an ideal world, we would have the covers over the incubators, we will have our lights down and we will have noise kept to a minimal. And we do then try very, very hard to make it look as if our babies um, are still in utero. While all of this is going on, what we are desperately, desperately, desperately hoping is that our mums will have been counselled about the importance of producing breast milk early and that tiny, tiny drop of colostrum that sometimes they are able to produce, we really, really want that to get into babies as soon as possible. And one of my current trainees has been doing a fantastic, fantastic piece of work with, with mums in one of our neonatal intensive care unit. And she's managed to increase the production of colostrum um, so that many more, I think, I think she's up to 50% of our preterm infants are receiving colostrum within the first six hours of life, which is absolutely fantastic because that colostrum is full of is full of nutrition, but more importantly, it's full of microorganisms and things that actually will modulate the baby's immune system and will grow up. And then they basically can fight off infection even more. Um, but also, it does actually affect the developing neurology system. So it's got a it's got a double double benefit for our babies. It's also protective, and I'll talk about some of the things it's protective about in a second. Um, Holly alluded to the fact 
that we can sometimes predict babies that are going to be born preterm. And in those babies, we try to help them. Um, and the things we can do to try and make their outcome better is that we can give to the mums antenatal steroids. And antenatal steroids will start the fetal lung um, producing the surfactant, that artificial surfactant. Well, it's not artificial, it's naturally producing surfactant. Um, so we know that if mama is able to receive two doses of steroid before she does actually give on, she goes on to, to deliver, um, the outcome for babies is much, much better. Holly's going to talk a little bit about another medicine that we now give to our preterm mums. So I'm not going to take, take her with the limelight away from her. But again, it's another amazing, amazing development that produces and protects our babies. Other interesting things that we know are that the outcome for girls, like Ruby, are actually much better than for boys. The outcome for singletons are much better than twins. And historically, bigger you are, the more you weigh at delivery, as long as it's healthy weight, actually you have more of a chance of a good outcome. But we do know that every single day makes a difference. And for every single baby, um, every baby is slightly, slightly different. So we do know that there will be occasional babies who survive at 23, 24, 25 weeks, but not every baby. But every single one thing we can do by getting them to deliver in the right place, by giving antenatal steroids, by getting colostrum and breast milk into these babies, by ideally achieving the, and the golden hour, by stabilization rather than resuscitation, all of those things are things we can do to try and improve the outcome for our babies. I'm happy to take questions if there are anything in the chat, chat box, or if I've said something you're thinking, I've got no idea what she's talking about. Um, otherwise, I will carry on with my next slide. Holly, is that okay? So, the sort of things that will have happened to um, babies like, um, like, um, like Ruby, so I've mentioned earlier, I've mentioned about the fact that all of our babies are put onto antibiotics to start with. Now, one of the reasons for that is that in some cases, there may be an infection that has caused a mum to go into preterm labour. Um, in the UK, we do not have a general and a wide stream, a wide, wide um, a, a sort of a screening pro programme um, for mums um, for something called group B strep. So group B streptococcus is the biggest and the most concerning cause of death in our preterm population across the UK, across the UK and the world. And in places in like Australia and some parts of the US, if a mum is found to have group B strep infection at any point in, deliver, in her antenatal course, um, they will be given antibiotics routinely throughout their pregnancy. In the UK, we actually don't think this is good practice because it encourages antibiotic resistance. Also, there are some mums that may actually develop an allergy to a penicillin and, and they actually may develop serious complications and even death. So we've done a huge amount of risk benefit in the UK. So we don't routinely give our mums um, penicillin. However, if we are aware that mum has had group B strep infection and has been symptomatic at any point in her pregnancy, we may give antibiotics. And um, if they've had a previous baby um, who has had been affected by group B strep, we will give antibiotics. Um, or if they go on and they have premature rupture of membranes, putting them at high risk of an ascending infection that might actually affect the baby, we may in those cases um, give, give, group, uh, give penicillin to the mums. But in all of our babies, if they're born preterm, we will give them 36 hours um, of antibiotics, generally broad spectrum, benzyl penicillin and gentamicin. And if they then don't look as if they've got an infection, we will stop that. Over the first few days of life, we will give them different antibiotics depending on how they're presenting. So within the first 48 hours, if it looks as if they're sick, um, we may give them something like flucloxacillin and gentamicin because we know the organisms that tend to affect our babies in those first 48 hours are different to those later on. 
past those first 48 hours, we then know that they are likely to get things that are later onset sepsis, which generally are a, a, a gram negative organism, often associated with the lines we've put in, often associated with what we've done to these babies, um, and therefore we give a different type of antibiotic. But I'm moving, I'm getting ahead of myself there. Um, so early onset sepsis, generally broad spectrum antibiotics, um, uh, sorry, narrow spectrum antibiotics, um, and hopefully we can, we can get away with that. With Ruby, she did as many of our babies do, and she got hypertension. Um, and sometimes the babies have what we call a honeymoon period, but for the first 24 hours, everything seems to be hunky-dory, and we keep our fingers crossed it all's gonna be good. And then what happens is their bodies suddenly go, I don't like being out. I'm not meant to be out. My heart's not gonna beat as well as it should, as it should do. My blood pressure's not gonna do what it should. And then we have a balance of what we do because we don't know what the right blood pressure is for a preterm baby. In the past, we have been slightly simplistic and we have said, right, okay, your mean blood pressure, if you can show us that you've got a mean blood pressure equivalent to your gestational age, that's great, we're happy with that. If you don't, we need to support. But actually, if I stood all of you in a room now and I did your blood pressure, I guarantee every single one of you would have a slightly different blood pressure. And I guarantee that if we did blood pressures on every single baby on a neonatal unit, they would also have, and, uh, of the same gestation, they would have slightly different gesta different blood pressures. And if I went to the postnatal wards and did blood pressures on every single healthy term baby on the postnatal ward, they would have different blood pressures. So we're trying to move away from being idiots and we're trying to start to think about what's right. So what we know that we're now working towards is the blood pressure a baby should have is the blood pressure that supports its vital functions, that there's enough blood going to its brain, that it's not going to get brain damage, that there's enough blood to get to its kidneys, so the kidneys function, i.e. they wee. There's enough blood going to the heart, that the heart doesn't have to beat too fast or doesn't beat too slowly because it hasn't got enough blood going to it. And that also the blood is able to be circulated to clear the waste products. So we look at things like lactates, we look at things like um, urine outputs, we look and see what the baby is doing and how they behave, because actually our nurses are really, really good at looking to see whether a preterm baby is well or is agitated or is any in distress or any pain. So we look at all of those things. And if we think, as we did with Ruby, that actually, despite giving her the benefit of the doubt, actually her blood pressure wasn't quite right, we then give them some, some support. We give them a little bit of, of, of blood product if they need it. We try not to if they don't. We give them a little bit of extra fluid, just something that's normal saline if we think they need it. But again, we've got to be very, very cautious because babies have got very, very fragile fluid balances. And if we suddenly give a preterm baby a load of extra fluid, their heart, which is probably just about managing, if we give them even an extra 10 mils per kilo, the heart may go, uh, uh, I don't like that extra fluid. That's pushing me to work even harder. I'm not gonna do what I'm gonna do. So again, we try not to if we don't. So what we do is we give them a little bit of inotropic support and try and get either the heart beating a bit faster or we try and get the blood pressure to, um, to go up by causing some vasoconstriction. But again, whatever we do, we have to do it very, very cautiously and very, very carefully because we know every single drug has a side effect and that might be a side effect on the developing brain, that might be a side effect on the kidneys, that might be a side effect on the biggest organ in the body, which is the skin. And I've already talked to you about how important it is for us to protect the skin because we want that skin to be as complete as possible, not to get break down and let in any nasty, nasty organisms that despite our best, best, best care might actually breach that, that skin barrier. So it's fun. It is really good. And we have to use a lot of, lot of, careful working out what we're doing and doing no harm.
And it's made even more fun by the fact that we've got no randomized controlled trials in neonates to say which are the best drugs to use. A part of the reason is you may or may not believe that I'm very, very persuasive and I can generally get people to do lots of things. But I can guarantee that if I walked onto a neonatal unit and said, or onto an antenatal ward and said to parents, look, you're going to have a baby. It's going to be very preterm. It's going to be probably quite sick. I don't know what to do. I could do what we've always done. Or I could do something that I don't know whether it's going to be any better for the baby or not. So will you give me permission to try an experiment on your new baby to see whether my new, new method may or may not work? Now, I could ask for a poll about how many people would think that I would be able to do it. And sometimes when I ask that question to my nurses, I've usually got about 50% of them to put, back, to put their hands up and say, yes, I would get permission. But actually, we do know, do no harm. And in something that is as important as life and death, we probably shouldn't be experimenting on our preterm infants. So the work we do, in, in, even in things like are we giving the right drugs to control blood pressure in preterm babies are extrapolated from either doing work on piglets um, or fetal, um, uh, fetal monkeys, or they're extrapolated from adult work. And adult babies are not small adults. So it's challenging, but it's fun. And we do our best to get it right. And we do our best to manage that hypertension in conjunction with our fluid management. So not giving too much fluid, just giving enough, and basically not just waiting 24 hours to look if we need to change fluids. We're changing our fluid balance every six hours, because again, we know that preterm infants, they lose fluid from their skin, they lose fluid from their kidneys. So there's lots and lots of fun things to wear. I've mentioned gut prime in that really, really that beautiful golden colostrum that every baby should have. It's the best thing. It's better than any medicines we can give. Not all mums are able to give us colostrum, and it's sad when it doesn't happen. But we need, and it is our job, to support every single mum to be able to do that. And hopefully they will then go on to produce breast milk so our babies don't have to have formulas. In preterm infants like Ruby, her mum had gallons and gallons and gallons of breast milk and she was fully entry fed. And that was the best, best, best thing for her. And you can see on the picture that Ruby has got an orogastric tube. So as soon as we possibly can, even on day one of life, we start with real small amounts of breast milk. And we know that that breast milk will protect the gut it protect from infection, it will be, and it will give neurological outcomes. So children who are breastfed are much, much better. They have much higher IQs than babies who have actually been fed or children who've had, um, had, 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 had to have formula. In those mums who can't breastfeed, for the extremely preterm babies, we give um, what we call donated or donor breast milk. And actually Ruby's mum was one of our lovely, lovely mums who had so much breast milk left over, she actually donated breast milk. So there are babies out there that will have been fed um, Ruby's mum's milk. Now, unfortunately, because her breast milk is designed for her own baby that she carried for 28 weeks, it doesn't have the right match of sort of immune modulating stuff. So those babies don't get that benefit, but they do get that nutritional input. I've got intraventricular hemorrhages there. We scan all our babies. We use an ultrasound scan. And what we do is with babies like Ruby on day one of life, we put an ultrasound scan on the soft spot at the top of the head and look at the ventricles to see if there are any bleeds. And we do that on day one of life, day three of life, day five of life. And then depending on what we find, um, we will then scan weekly or two weekly, uh, and as long as until we can see that the brain has stopped, well, I won't say stopped developing, but stopped being at high risk of bleeding because the ventricles within the developing brain are incredibly fragile. Um, they actually are very susceptible to um, fluid balance if it's not right. They're susceptible to, uh, to hypotension and hypertension. And if they bleed, they can, we can, we can have basically, um, I always like to describe as bruises within the brain. 
hopefully those brazes will resolve, but sometimes they don't and they break down and they actually cause damage to the developing brain. So much, much higher risk of um, intraventricular hemorrhages and ongoing cerebral palsy. The good thing though about the preterm brain is, is it's plastic. And I don't mean it's, it's plastic per se, but it's, that the pathways are plastic. And you can, it's not uncommon to find preterm infants who have got horrible, horrible, horrible head scans on one side, but then actually do everything and grow up to have absolutely normal lives. And that's because sometimes yeah, the, the pathways will, re, will, will basically move around and they'll grow around the holes. Um, so unlike adults who have strokes and then can't use one part of their body or one side of their body, a preterm infant, the brain will often develop around to be able to give um, a normal pathway and a normal development. I'm going to get Holly to move me on to my next slide because I can talk forever. The important things here are, any, are really, really important is NEC. So necrotizing enterocolitis is one of those things we do not understand. It is an awful, awful, awful disease that happens to our preterm infants. The more preterm you are, the more likely you are. The more complications you are, the more likely you are to have NEC. Now, what we hope, NEC basically is abdominal distension. It is damage to the gut wall, the intestinal wall. We do not want, know why it happens. We have no idea. We do not know why somebody, some babies get it and some don't. What we do know is the stormier and sicker the baby is, and the more preterm the baby is, the more likely they are to have NEC. What we do know, though, is babies who are given breast milk are much less likely to have NEC than any other babies. If a baby does have NEC, um, we can manage them medically. And the things we have to do is we rest their guts seven days or even 10 days. Now that leads into other problems because we then have to, we can't feed them. So we then have to have invasive lines. Every invasive life and line has, makes you at a higher risk of an infection. Um, and we then have to support them with parental nutrition, which puts them at much higher risk of liver damage, of jaundice and lots of other problems. Um, however, Occasionally we have babies that we can't support just medically and they need to have a, a nice trip in an ambulance in lots of cases um, over to see the surgeons because a lot of neonatal units are not co-located with a surgical unit. So where I work in the West Midlands, um, my transport team have to take a little baby, thankfully not Ruby, um, but lots of babies like Ruby across um, in the back of an ambulance. And you can imagine the challenges of putting a 400, 500, 600 gram baby, and um, probably who is intensely sick by this point, and they generally are, um, traveling them in the back of an ambulance, um, bumpy roads, all of these things to go and meet the nice surgeons. We're very, very lucky to have fabulous surgeons where I work that give really good outcomes for our baby and do the best for our outcomes for our babies. But generally, what they need to do is cut out that bit of affected gut. So a 500 gram baby is left, left with a stoma. We then do have to rest that gut. So again, they are dependent on invasive um, nutrition um, and then sometimes we find that they have to go back again and see the surgeon because there perhaps maybe a stricture that hadn't picked up on the first time. So it's returning. Eventually, hopefully, they will go back and have their, their guts joined up and they will end up being happy, healthy children. But it is a huge, huge, huge pathway. And a lot of these babies end up with short gut which means that they are, they are dependent on, on parental nutrition and do end up on a paediatric ward for a long time. The worst case scenarios are those babies who have such short guts that they will need to go on to have an intestinal transplant. Um, and that does happen in, in some of our population. Um, with the sickest babies, um, despite what we do, despite trying to match our, our strategies of ventilation to do no harm, to not overventilate them, they just don't want to come off our ventilators. So we then have to have the, these awful, awful chats with parents about they do need to come off the ventilator. We need to give them postnatal steroids to help this, to try and damp down that nasty inflammation in the, in the 
in the, the, the lung. The problems with postnatal steroids, and we know this, is they decrease the chance for good neurological output, so outcome. So despite doing all of this great stuff, we're then having to give them steroids to drop their IQs. However, being on a ventilator does that anyway. So it's a little bit being stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. And most parents say, you know, say, yep, if that's what you say we need to do, that's what we do. And we do. Holly, can I have my next slide? I mentioned there about, um, about deafness and blindness. Um, and this again is Ruby having um, some drops put into, into her eyes. Um, because what we do is once babies hit about 28 weeks, we start asking our ophthalmologists to come and have a look at their eyes to make sure that the pathways, that the, um, the blood vessel development um, is going the right way because of the things we've done to them, because of the oxygen we've given them. And we know that if that doesn't happen in the right way, they are at risk of retinal detachment because what happens is they get vessels growing in the wrong place. Those vessels either burst and bleed um, or they basically grow and they, they grow over the retina and then they, they start to pull and pull that retina. We know that if we find babies at risk of this, our lovely, lovely, lovely ophthalmologists can do things like laser therapy um, and they can actually, it sounds awful, they burn the aberrant blood vessels. And actually, if they burn them and they stop them growing, um, we can actually have babies then who have good eyesight um, rather than no eyesight at all because they've got retinal detachment. Ruby's eyesight is brilliant. She's not even wearing glasses. Um, but we have, to put, we have to put the drops in so the ophthalmologist can actually see what's going on. I've got here PDA ligation, and generally that's for those babies who are stuck on the ventilator. And it's because the duct that was open in utero, because the lungs weren't needed, has stayed open. And what ha happens now is that blood, rather than being diverted beautifully around the body, um, also keeps going through the lungs and floods the lungs. So the, the, it's really hard to ventilate these babies. So again, we have to send them across to see our cardiothoracic surgeons. Back of an ambulance again, if you're not on the same site as your cardiothoracic surgeons, but they get them ducts ligated. And it's rather neat. So in the olden days, you used to have to do this via a big, nasty, big, big scar down the center of the chest. Now they just have this really, really neat little scar and the left armpit. Um, and I don't know how they do it, but they still, this, you know, cardiothoracic surgeons manage to ligate the duct rather than ligate the aorta, which is a similar size. Um, in these 800 gram babies. And we then, that Helen helps us get pushed off the ventilator, which is great. Okay, Holly can have my next slide. Much later, sometimes if babies are still on our neonatal unit, 44 weeks, so four weeks past their due date, um, we have to say goodbye to them because we're not good at doing things like talking to pre to talking to babies. We're not good at doing sort of physio. We're not too good at, at that later neurodevelopment care. So what we do is we either send them across to the children's ward, um, ideally within the same hospital if there is a children's ward. Um, where I work, unfortunately, there isn't. So it's a mother and baby hospital. So again, we call on my friendly ambulance service, our, our transport service, um, to take them off to either back to their local hospital to be closer to home or to a, another children's ward. And it's there, they will then be taught to feed. And that can be a major, major problem because a lot of these babies are really orally averse. Um, which is why you can probably see in Ruby's picture, she's got a pacifier or a dummy in, inside you, uh, in, in, not inside you, in her mouth. Because what we try from an early age onwards is if we're giving feeds down the orogastric tube or the nasal, nasal gastric tube, we give them a dummy at the same time. So hopefully they start to, to get used to sucking and feeling that the tummy is full. What we also do is we give them just a little bit of colostrum, a little bit of breast milk on a syringe directly into their mouth so they can taste that milk, tastes lovely. Um, so hopefully we get them to learn to suck. Sometimes babies are still stuck on oxygen at the time of delivery, at, the, the, at, the, you know, at, at 44 weeks, um, and even younger these days. And what we know is that babies get better quicker when they are at home. So now we have lovely, lovely outreach teams. We have 24-7 nursing care. Um, so once a baby is over 50% tube fed and that the parents are able to tube feed them if they're still on oxygen 
we say, hey, ho, we don't want you in the hospital because you're going to get a nasty bug and any of these things. And we can always fill our beds. Let's send you home on oxygen and we'll get your mums and your dads to feed you and just to, you know, to, to take you out. You can go out in, in your buggy with a little bit of oxygen and it's brilliant. And our babies get better. They come off oxygen much, much quicker. However, there are still some babies that at a year of age will still need oxygen. And we're really, really happy that they're, on, they're at home on oxygen. And I'm not talking about ridiculous amounts, I'm talking about low amounts, but they are at home on, uh, in oxygen. They can go out, they can do normal daily things. Their parents can do, go and do normal daily things. And eventually, around your year of life, um, we get them off the oxygen because by that time their lungs have grown and they no longer need it. We love our babies. We don't want to give them up away to everybody else. And our preterm babies are extremely preterm infants born up to at less than 32 weeks gestation. All those babies who have had a complicated time, we follow them up because we want to know what they're doing. But eventually, and I had to do this with Ruby, but in fact, I actually discharged it because she was fine. And it was lovely because at the time, um, I could see her in the church because we went to the same church. So I, I know Ruby now. I see what, see what she does. But eventually, it's about two years of life. You either discharge them or you pass them on to your friendly paediatrician or your community paediatrician because they know what to do when they're a bit bigger and they've got teeth. Polly, can I have the next slide? And I think it's over to you because I've talked for a lot of, of enough for the moment. So I'm going to put myself on to mute. Thank you very much, Dr. Philpot. Um, I'm sure that everyone has learned an awful lot and now understands that complex journey from preterm to healthy infant or at least to discharge from the neonatal unit. Um, so I am aware of the time and that you probably are wanting to eat and whatnot. Um, so I won't spend too long talking about this, but um, we've just got four kind of research um, and trials that are going on or have been going on at the minute that we just wanted to kind of make you aware of um, really interesting trials, um, some of which little bits Dr. Philpot has mentioned. Um, so to begin with the precept uh, trial or the prevention of cerebral palsy and preterm labor trial is actually the first ever perinatal quality improvement program that has been delivered across the whole of England. I think if I'm correct, Dr. Phil Potts Hospital is involved in this trial um, and it's designed to help reduce cerebral palsy in babies um, through the administration of um, magnesium sulfate antenatally. So uh, during to the mothers um, during the preterm um, labor period. So we know that magnesium sulfate is neuroprotective um, and it's been found on this trial so far that for every 37 um, mums who are given magnesium sulfate below 30 weeks um, gestation, one case of cerebral palsy is prevented, which may not seem like a huge amount, but when you think about how many people are pregnant every year worldwide, how many of those pregnancies are preterm, um, they really do add up and that's a huge a huge step in, in the future for neonatal medicine. Um, another trial that's going on um, is surfactant or not, the Suffron trial. Um, Dr. Philpot explained lovely what surfactant is. And this trial aims to investigate whether giving surfactant early um, to you know, those late preterm and early term infants actually helps with respiratory distress and prevents them from needing that really invasive support that we don't want to give. Um, and this is because we know that many preterm and early term infants either don't make enough surfactant or the surfactant that they make doesn't work. Um, and then that leads to breathing problems and the need for really invasive um, management techniques, which we really don't want. Um, some of the smaller um, kind of studies that are going on um, are the next two. So the first one I'll mention is the Toskin study. So the timing of stoma closure in neonates. Again, Dr. Philpot lovely men, uh, mentioned lovely about um, kind of issues with the bowel of some um, preterm infants and the need for a stoma in some of these patients. And what we don't know at the minute is when to best remove this stoma. So the stoma is fitted to um, these preterm infants um, temporarily in a life-saving procedure. Um, but when we remove these stomas is a little bit in dispute and we don't know when the best time for that is. Um, 
and every practice and every trust um, across the UK actually has different kind of timings of when they would remove the stoma and what we're trying to find with this study is when is the best time so that that infant can then go on to lead a healthy and normal infancy childhood adulthood and whatnot and then the final one that I'll mention is the spring pilot study um, and this aims to identify whether these very preterm um, babies actually have variations in their DNA or not um, that have been previously identified to increase the risk of neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, so the study has actually found quite interestingly that some of the children who are born before 32 weeks um, do actually go on to develop um, neuropsychiatric disorders such as ADHD and autism. Um, so really interesting study, a little bit different to the other three. Um, so that's currently kind of what's going on nationwide and worldwide with regards to um, neonatal medicine, all very interesting. And hopefully by the time we end up um, working as consultants, some of these will have really taken off and we'll, we'll see the outcome of these. Um, so there isn't much more to say other than really like, thank you so much for sticking with us, for listening. I hope that you've learned something. And um, if not from me, definitely from Dr. Philpott. I hope that we've increased, um, you know, your interest for neonatal medicine. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I might not know the answer, but Dr. Philpott certainly will. Um, we have had a question. Um, Komal has asked, how does the microbiome develop in neonates? Um, so really, really interesting question. That actually was part of my, um, my, my, my thesis when I was um, doing an MD some time ago. Um, so we know that um, when a baby is born, generally, um, when, when they, when the, the, the first micro, the first um, microorganisms that colonize their, um, their guts are actually de derived from the female um, sort, of, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of genital region. Um, so, and, and, and when babies are, so we know that the microbiome and microflora is different in babies delivered by cesarean section compared to, um, to, to compared to the normal vaginal delivery. So very, very different. Um, the, the microbiome then de de develops depending on what they're exposed to. So again, we know that that is different depending on whether they get a full, get formal feed or whether, which is a sterile, uh, a, should be a sterile um, sort of feed, um, or whether they get breast milk, which can, already contains microorganisms. So, it, it's exposure. So all babies are born theoretically with a sterile gut, um, but depending on what they are exposed to, um, that influences what happens to them. Um, and I spent, as I said, I, I spent a very interesting um, time um, going around um, neonatal units, uh, collecting baby poo to analyse, to find out what was living in their poo, and then following these babies up and finding out what was in their stool at sort of six weeks and then six months um, and also going to normal baby clinics so babies who hadn't been on a neonatal unit to have a cohort study and to find out what happens in, in the normal population so I ended up going to um, some healthcare health visit clinics and having to say to poor mums have you got a, has your baby got a dirty nappy and um, if so would you sign my consent form or can we take a bit of the poo um, so, so it develops depending very much on exposure. Does that answer your question? It, it was, it was, but I got, I got very, very passionate about, um, about organisms in baby's pool. Um, and, it, and it was funny that the organisms would persist, even resistant organisms would persist for quite a long time. So even a small thing that you do right in the beginning um, may, can, can actually, you know, leave babies um, having a being at a disadvantage um, because their microorganism or their flora doesn't develop in the way it should. Thank you, Dr. Philpot. We've got a couple more questions. Um, this is a really interesting one, actually. Mm. Are premature births 
that premature baby is more immunocompromised? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The same, the same as um, you would, you know, the fact that when they're born, they, 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 you know, their, their, their lungs haven't developed, their heart hasn't developed. Um, so basically every single, every single system you can think of is less developed. Um, we also, the, then uh, because of what happens as well is that if, for instance, they are they are growth restricted because there's been a placental problem. Um, the bone marrow is, is one of those, um, those systems that actually gets affected more than any other system. So babies are, even, fe even fetuses are amazingly clever. Um, if there is a problem with blood flow, um, the blood will be diverged to the brain, to the kidneys, to the gut, um, because that's the important stuff, the heart. Um, so what happens in the blood doesn't get diverted to the bone marrow. So these babies can be born and they can have incredibly low white cell counts and they also can have incredibly low platelet counts so we see it very 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 commonly so that's a why we give them prophylactic antibiotics when we start but we stop them as soon as we can but we also give them prophylactic antifungals because if a you know just a candida is if that gets into the bloodstream of a preterm baby the baby dies there is no two ways about it um and they can die as quickly as you know within within hours um it doesn't matter if you get nice big antifungals into them um uh, invasive candida is a killer and the last 23 week i looked after was doing very very nicely until she got an invasive candida infection um, she was dead before we actually got the positive blood culture which is really 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 sad um, so they're tricky, um, but we love them and we will do whatever we can to try and get them through. And we've got some good ideas and hence that's why prophylactic antifungals, um, we give that orally. It's one of the few things we give them orally to try and colonize and try and protect the gut. Thank you. Um, another microbiome related question. Um, mm that Zoe's asked is, do the microbiomes of the recipient and the donor have to be compatible in intestinal transplants? And can no. the different uh, microbiomes cause complications? So, so what, ha what will happen with both of them? They will, there will be a beautiful steril sterility um, and immunosuppression. So we, we, we don't do an intestinal transplant until the baby is big. So, so it's gonna be, it'll be a child by that point. So we're looking at two, three, four, five years old. Um, there is in, in the same way as happens with all transplants, there is almost a suppression of the, um, the recipient's um, immune system. Um, and then what will happen is the same, whether it's an intestine, whether it's heart, whatever, um, that, that organ um, is, 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 I won't say inserted, uh, but, it, but, it's, it, but it's given to the child. Um, and what you then would expect is that whatever is there hopefully will thrive. Um, the child, though, will continue on immunosuppressants, um, though, to try and prevent um, any um, incompatibility with what is in the transplant and what is in the recipient. Um, but really nice question. Thank you. We don't have any more that have come through, but I have one myself, if that's OK. No, no, it's not. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you've got preterm twins and you are mimicking that in uterine environment in an incubator, would you put them in the same incubator? No, no we, we don't. Um, and a lot, a part of the reason is that it's, pr it's practical more than anything else. So our incubators um, have got portals both sides because you need to be able to get in and out of incubators. And depending on, you know, what you don't want to do is, is leaning across and rubbing, rummaging across a baby to get to one side or the other. And um, even though preterm infants are very small, the equipment that we use is not very small. So if you've walked onto an adult intensive care unit, um, our equipment is the same size. So from a practical point of view, um, having the equipment, that, that wouldn't work either. Um, we have, for intensive care, the, the, the rules are one nurse to one baby. 
Um, so we'd, have, we'd almost have nurses fighting over each other in an incubator. Um, so we, we wouldn't do that. But what we do is that as soon as the baby is old enough and stable enough, we have twin time. Um, so in my hospital, we do not have twin um, cots at the moment. Um, that is something that some places do. But what we will do is as soon as the baby, our babies are stable enough, um, we'll have them out for, for kangaroo care. Um, twin kangaroo care, tandem feeding, and it's lovely when you see a mum who's got both, who is sitting there, you know, she's got twins, both one one attached um, to each breast, just fantastic. Um, we don't do with triplets, <laughs> but, but we, what we, so we, we basically get them to, we get them to each other as quickly as we possibly can. Oh, that's that's so interesting as well. Um, thank you. We don't have any other questions. Um, so guys, you are more than welcome to, to get off and enjoy your evening. Um, I think there is a, a feedback form in if you just fill that out and then you'll all get a certificate. Um, I don't know whether Komal wants to 